Hi, everyone. We will be starting in just a moment. Um, thank you all for joining us. We'll take just about 10 or 15 seconds longer, and then we will begin. Okay, just another check of those who are uh, going to be participating today. I want to ensure that we have everyone on the call from Team OSDE that's supposed to be. Uh, we will get started here now in just a moment. Thanks for all of you who've joined today. The, this is the all district call and um, We'll go ahead and get started. I want to start with a bit of information update for you. There are 200, I'm sorry, there are 2,894 confirmed positive cases of COVID-19 in Oklahoma as of today. There are six additional deaths reported, uh, but only two occurred in the past 24 hours. Uh, that brings the total deaths to 170 in Oklahoma. Right now, Governor Stitt is holding a press conference where we expect him to announce some details about his reopening Oklahoma plan. It's important to note that this will not change the school closure order for this school year. However, we look forward to additional information to help in planning for the summer and the fall. And if there are any information that is provided during that press conference that we need to make you aware of immediately, we have our communications team following that and they will break in. So speaking of reopening, we know many of you are anxious about what the school year will look like uh, come August. And unfortunately, we just do not have specific information to share with you about what exactly that will look like at this time. We do know that it is very likely um, that we will, there will be some portion of closure at some point uh, in the 2020-21 school year. This may be isolated to certain students or families, schools, or even districts, depending on the path of the virus. As we also have done this entire time, OSDE will strive to provide guidance and information as quickly as we have it. Right now, we encourage you to be thinking about contingency plans for these types of scenarios. We are doing the same and we'll again share information very rapidly as soon as we have it. But we are working with a team and that is building both internally and then with experts outside and those of you who are practicing um, this work as teachers or district leaders as well. Um, so I'd also like to give you some updates about the FAQs that were sent out on Friday night. Please refer to these for new information. There are a few things that you all asked about in these conversations that we have and I want to bring to your attention. Um, first, cleaning out lockers and desks. Governor Stitt has indicated Oklahoma's safer at home directive is likely to be lifted, at least in part, after April the 30th. We expect more details on the rollout of uh, reopening later this week. A reminder that the state board's directive closes school buildings for the general student population until the end of the school year, May 8th or later, depending on your district and your district plan. 
So any plan to temporarily open school buildings for students to retrieve belongings should be implemented after the directive has been lifted and only those staff members, students and families who are not particularly susceptible to complications from COVID-19, those over, or I'm sorry, um, particularly those over the age of 65 or uh, immunocompromised or with pre-existing conditions um, would be allowed in. Um, be sure to stay up to date with the most recent SDE, I'm sorry, CDC guidance in making these decisions. Um, we will do the best that we can to assist you in doing so. Uh, but that is um, all under the um, topic of cleaning out lockers and desks. Um, it, it is not important to do that right now, certainly, um, while we are still under the um, Safer at Home executive order. Okay, let's talk about driver's ed. Driver's education, as you know, students must complete 30 hours of classroom instruction and six hours of actual driving time with a certified instructor in order to complete a public school driver's education course. Many students have likely completed the required 30 hours of coursework, but not the six hours of driving time. So in order to assist schools and students in completing these requirements, OSDE will allow the parent or guardian of a student whose public school driver education course was interrupted by school closures to complete the required six hours of driver time with the parent or guardian. The parent will be required to attest to the completion of the driving, I'm sorry, to the completion of the drive time on the certificate of completion. OSDE is working on an updated certificate specifically for these students and will release that in the coming days. And I hope you're on, Daryl Floyd. All right. Um, I know many of you have had um, assistant principals and principals that are clamoring to get that answer. So we are pleased to be able to give that. All right, another topic, CARES Act funds. FAQs released Friday evening have several new questions um, that are answered on the CARES Act funds and funding flexibility for current year funds. So I encourage you to read these closely because they're, they do include new information. The 30 day mark for when USDE has to make the application for SEAs for CARES Act funds available is coming up. We expect to see that by the end of this week, OSDE stands ready to have that application and apply for those funds as quickly as we can. But we do expect that to become available uh, for our agency to apply to draw down those funds this week, by the end of the week. Once that is approved, and we are told that's going to be approved um, very rapidly within 24 hours, possibly. Once it's approved, we will release the LEA application. It has been tested and is ready to go. Um, we do not have many other details on the funding flexibility other than what has already been shared in our FAQ, so keep that in mind. USD has not released any further information, but we do expect to get guidance in the SEA application and FAQs from USDE. Funds will be available to be spent through September 2021. And we expect that there will be some flexibility to have for uh, reimbursement of expenses back into March. For example, the governor's education relief funds can be used for expenses incurred beginning March 13th. It's reasonable to expect that our funds would have a similar beginning date. In other news, you may have heard that there is another relief package moving through Congress, passing the Senate last evening. It is our understanding that this does not contain additional funding for schools, but expands on the small business loan program put into place in a prior package. We do continue to hear that additional relief packages are coming and will continue funding or I'm sorry, and will contain funding for local governments, um, including school districts, which may include additional funds for the E-rate program. 
State Board of Education meeting. That is tomorrow. So the State Board of Education will meet and I wanted to let you know of two items on the agenda that you will have interest in, particular interest in. The OSDE will recommend the board extend the due dates for, au for audits of districts expending less than 750,000 in federal funds. Currently, these audits are due April 30th and the requested extension is to June 30th, 2020. For those districts expending more than 750,000 in federal funds, those audits were received last month. Um, also, the OSDE will recommend a process for the award of temporary certificates to those individuals who have had interrupted, um, who have been interrupted in their pathway to certification. So let me give you some examples. Um, examples of interruption include an individual who was not able to take the assessment due to the testing centers being closed, or an individual who has not been able to fully satisfy the requirements for student, te for student teaching. The, pro the full process by Pathway is available on OSDE website with the handouts for tomorrow's meeting. Lastly, regarding the state budget. I am sure you have all been seeing in the news um, the predicament we are in with our state budget and a general revenue failure and a bleak projection going forward. We are so grateful to our legislative leaders for working diligently to hold education and state government flat for the remainder of this fiscal year. Based on conversations in the last 24 hours, it will be incredibly challenging for legislative leaders to hold education flat next year. However, I know it is the desire of the House and the Senate leadership to protect education to the greatest extent possible. That is what we want. And we appreciate and are extremely grateful that they continue to stand with that, that commitment and desire, um, even as they face uncertainty. There are a lot of big numbers swirling for percentage of cuts for the future and for next year, even though we know it is their desire to keep us held flat. Um, but none of that is certain. So what I would urge you to do is three things right now. One, plan for the worst case scenario. We must be prepared in this uh, ever-changing climate for drastic measures. Two, encourage legislative leadership to stand strong for education. There are many competing interests and our leaders are fighting hard for us. And third, tell your stories. We have many, many new legislators who were not here with us under, uh, during the time of the 2016 and 2017 general revenue uh, failure and the difficulty that uh, under collection of funds have on our, uh, our overall budget, not just our appropriated budget. They may not be fully, um, they may not fully understand the impact that significant cuts will have on education. So respectfully, let them know how the cuts will impact your districts. This is critical. And um, we, we just, you know, have to continue to advocate for what our children need, especially at a time when we know the learning loss is real, it is happening, it is not going to be something that can be easily resolved in the next nine weeks of school when the fall opens. These kinds of losses that we're experiencing due to COVID-19 are going to have a much, much longer lasting impact. And we're going to have to be strategic and invest in the, what it will take to be able to close those gaps where they were already standing wide open to begin with. So please tell those stories of what those cuts could mean. All right, um, now at this time, uh, we'll go back to the chat box. It looks like there's a, a few things in the chat box and um, I appreciate you all being on the call and we're more than happy to um, answer any questions. Hey, Superintendent, this is Carolyn, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, um, we've had several questions about graduation ceremonies um, with the thinking that, um, you know, school is coming to an end um, around May 8th or after, and um, with the governor considering opening plans over the next few weeks, um, got a lot of questions about whether or not schools could have graduation ceremonies after uh, those uh, things have been rolled out or after May 8th. Thoughts about that? Well, I know that's something that many of you are having to um, wrestle with, and uh, this is not easy. So I would say that the most important thing is that we have to respect the social distancing and we cannot make plans in uh, the upcoming weeks for any kind of group um, ceremony, unless it is virtual. Uh, I would say please follow CDC guidance. If you are planning something in the summer or at the very end of June, uh, that is something still that remains to be seen if that would be possible. Um, but I do know I'll pass along something that one superintendent shared with me. He, he just mentioned that if we were to postpone um, the virtual in lieu of a later um, maybe early summer or midsummer ceremony, and then that is disrupted, he would have regretted doing something even virtually in May. So I do know there are some who are doing a virtual ceremony in May and then planning a physical gathering at another time in, in the future. Uh, but at least there will be that time in May where students expect to have that kind of um, ceremony and uh, it can still be meaningful, even though it's virtual. I'm not sure if I fully answered that question. And um, Yeah, I, I think, um, Superintendent, if I may chime in, um, there's still a lot unknown about what the, you know, what will be lifted and what the rollout will be as far as social distancing. And so until we have more information um, from the governor's office, it's a little difficult to say that it's okay to go ahead and have a, a graduation ceremony as normal or even one that includes, you know, some distancing. So I think that's a, a stay tuned, but uh, uh, seems unlikely at least um, in the next couple of weeks um, until we have more information. I um, had some questions about, you mentioned um, the, the worst case scenario for budget and that's what we need to be planning for. Would you have any insight on what that worst case scenario might be? No, I wouldn't. Um, I do know that uh, when we have seen, uh, in fact, I don't know that we have ever seen across the board cuts at the same percentage rate. Um, that that if that were to have happened, it would not be during legislative session. So the legislators are there engaged in working on this. Um, we don't know what, what that might mean. And I am just saying to you uh, that it is best that you think in different scenarios. We have to be thinking about um, how we are going to approach learning with being ready with different scenarios that we could face and the same thing happens with the budget. Um, we have absolutely no idea, but we do know what has been stated publicly and continues to be um, a, a strong desire of the legislature to hold education flat. Um, I do think that they will do everything within their power to accomplish that or very close to it. Um, okay. Carolyn, do yes. you have anything else that you would want to add or anyone else um, from our team? I, I don't. I think you captured it well, Superintendent. Okay. Um, next topic, and this may be um, uh, for Brad, uh, about driver's education. Um, what about driver's education in the summer? Do you have any suggestions for um, how schools might plan for that? Yeah, uh, I, I think that actually bodes uh, into the other subject of summer school activities and, and the graduation, talking about staying tuned. Uh, I think we will have more information on that as we get closer to that time. Um, but at this time, the, the form that we have uh, revised and worked with DPS on should satisfy that to the extent that an extension of the um, distance learning uh, continues into the summer school activities. 
All right, very good. Okay, and we mentioned um, uh, a certification for other pathways, but we have a question about emergency certified teachers um, that were unable to take their exams. Um, what did they need to do uh, in order to continue? Um, if all of the other circumstances fit and it's, um, you know, year one, year two emergency, then it might be appropriate for that district to request uh, the next year on the emergency certificate so that those exams could be taken during the next year. Okay. Sorry, I'm scanning questions. <laughs> Um, should districts plan for distance learning for the fall semester next year? Good question. Um, and that's one of the things we want to be able to provide for you with a recovery uh, task force and some recommendations. Um, I think the answer to that is that it's likely there will be a need for some form of distance learning in the future. Uh, we know that uh, we are to expect a resurgence uh, or outbreaks for COVID-19. And that is going to include then if we're going to have uh, uninterrupted um, education that somehow, whether it's one student at a time or a class or uh, a school out of a multi-school district um, or an area a uh, region, it, there's going to be a, additional disruption and, and that's just going to be a, a fact until we have a um, vaccine. So we believe it is very important to be investing in uh, these types of opportunities for distance learning that is virtual. And that's why our focus to the governor with his funds and any funds that we are able to get our hands on, we want to see a, a dedicated investment in closing the digital divide where we can focus on connectivity or devices, um, hotspots, cellular um, answers to those questions, whatever it takes so that our students will be able to have a way to have um, online learning if that is needed. And that's something that we know districts have prepared for, but not all districts have had the opportunity. So this is a priority in our proposal to the governor with, a, with his GEAR funds. Um, and it will be something that we will present uh, for a little bit more formally in conversation with him. Uh, we have that scheduled and we're it, with his team and we are um, confident that we have a common interest in doing in doing this. Um, so I just want you to know we're working on that piece and we are also working on the ability to have some of the vendors that are already in our state um, leveraging a state rate for some of what they offer so that you can offer more than what maybe you have right now or uh, you can get a better rate in doing so. And that's something we are planning uh, so that we would have it completely finalized, done, and in your hands um, in the month of June. I have um, another question about um, funding. With the expected shortfall, do we see any possibility for assistance that would be allowed to be used in next school year as a means to provide meaningful remedia remediation um, or for programs and salaries? And I'm not sure if this is referring to federal funds and we might be able to speak to it from that perspective. Um, I think because the state funds are so unknown, let's go ahead and address federally. Carolyn, do you wanna try? Sure. So the, the CARES Act um, funds um, that districts will be getting are fairly flexible and there is um, a specific provision that allows um, districts to use these funds for continuity of services, including continuing to provide um, salaries um, and employing um, district staff um, to the greatest extent possible. Um, so I think that that will help. I don't know if it will be enough to overcome the state shortfall, but that um, that should assist. And I, I hope that answers the question. I'm not certain. 
Okay, we have a couple of child nutrition questions. I think Jennifer is on the phone. I am here. A uh, question about, um, uh, it's a plan to um, over, excuse me, let me start over. It is our plan to, to change to the summer lunch program that they would have normally done in May and June, uh, but they've not typically provided meals in the month of July. Is there a way to revise the application um, for July and August? Okay, if you're referring to the SSO, which is the seamless summer option, which everyone is doing now, the July and August application will not be available in the CARS system until we roll over the FY21 CARS um, information. And that will be done earlier than, than normal. We normally do it by July 1. We are going to do it earlier. There's some additions we're making to that system in order to get that rolled out as, as quickly as possible. So once that does roll out for the new fiscal year, we will send an alert out in CARS telling you you can get in and complete your application for FY21, which would include SSO. Um, if you're referring to the summer feeding program, um, you would need to reach out to Dee Houston and let her know that you want to extend and do meals into July. I wasn't sure if you're referring to SSO or SFSP. So either way, Jennifer, that is possible? To serve meals into July? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. <clears throat> I love that question and I appreciate the thinking. Um, I know that historically schools have dropped off their service uh, in the summer and uh, this, this summer more than ever, our families that are without paychecks and are, are going to um, also be having unemployment um, drop uh, are, are in the coming months, you know, following the summer, they're, they're really going to be uh, grateful for these resources and I hope that our schools uh, will continue to provide it. I know it is very, very um, draining of your staff and having to get volunteers, uh, particularly in the summer, but we can do this. There are people who want to help and we would love to be able to deploy uh, those volunteers who stand ready to help. Okay, um, uh, maybe um, pitching to Brad, there are a couple of questions about um, the uh, third year emergency certification process and if we have any additional information on that yet. And then you might also take the opportunity, there was a, a couple of questions about background checks. Sure, um, on, on the first portion of that, the uh, third year, that is the maximum period of validity for an emergency Certificate, um, that rule was actually extended and passed by the state board at, at the March meeting. Uh, so at this time, uh, the maximum period will be three years. Um, with respect to background checks, uh, that, that is addressed in our most recent round of FAQs. I believe it is on page 27. Uh, there's references in there to the remote centers that are still open. Uh, background checks are a statutory requirement that cannot be waived. Uh, so no matter what pathway we are talking about, those requirements are not able to be waived. Uh, those remote uh, locations for background checks are still open and running uh, at this time. And again, I think that's on page 27 of the FAQs. Okay, there are a couple of other child nutrition questions. Um, uh, so maybe jump over to Jennifer um, and you may be able to see them, but um, um, are there any expected problems um, that could be caused by um, um, exceeding um, cost of meals or going, or the cost of meals being higher than usual or districts um, spending more on meals um, than, than typical? Uh, do you expect for those uh, claims to be able to be paid? Yes, yes, the claims will be paid. Um, and, and with summer SSO and with summer feeding, all meals being claimed are paid at the free rate of reimbursement. Unlike normally during national school lunch and school breakfast, you're claiming the meals at a categorical free reduced or paid um, count. But it's, it, yes, if you're serving meals, they're gonna be reimbursed as long as they're reimbursable. That's the main thing. The meals have to meet reimbursement. Um, but as far as our, is it going to throw a red flag if your meal counts are higher than normal? I don't believe that's going to be the case. We know that you may be serving additional children in your area because of younger siblings 
or potentially um, private school kids might be coming to eat, charter school children might be coming to eat, depending on where you are. So we do realize that in, in areas there are going to be some high counts right now. And um, no, that I no, that's not going to be a red flag for us. I, I hope I answered that the way you were asking, it, meaning for it to be answered. And, and I want to just also um, underscore what Jennifer said that, you know, we are celebrating the fact that you are serving more meals than normal. And uh, we put out a press release today uh, just sharing that in the first week after, after spring break, um, the you know, Oklahoma schools get sent uh, or provided uh, 1.7 million meals in just that week time. So that's incredible. We know that in certain districts, you've already done that, um, or 2 million meals um, in just a, a, a very short period. So we are really, really grateful for what's happening in the state and how you are making um, uh, just conquering barriers that we know are there and you are making an investment up front to make this possible for for your families and they need it so badly so thank you someone hey. asked a question yeah, go about, ahead, Jennifer. okay someone asked a question about um increasing teacher prices i believe it's gone up a little bit now i can't find it you're required by regulations to charge your adults, teachers, visitors, et cetera, um, the minimum, the free rate plus the value of commodities plus the additional seven cents in reimbursement that, that you receive for meeting meal patterns. That's the, the minimum you have to charge the adults. You can always charge adults during the National School Lunch School Breakfast Program more than that minimum. If you charge less than the minimum or don't charge them at all, that does become a flex benefit, there's other things that come into play there, and non-federal funds have to cover the difference of that, that you're not charging the full amount. Um, I'm hoping that answered that question, but as far as what you charge your adults, there is a minimum, but you can go above that if that's what you choose to do as your, at your district. Um, Chris, I'm glad to hear that you're serving a lot of students. That's awesome. Um, there are no more summer training, summer feeding Program, summer feeding program trainings. We have, we did 13 or 14 last count, and we did one by webinar two weeks ago. I'm kind of losing track of time. I apologize. Um, the deadline to apply for summer feeding is April 30th, and that's simply because we have to have time to approve all these. Um, we can't fast track it. Unfortunately, there's nothing that has come out regulatory, uh, to waive that regulatory requirement. And you all have to be approved for summer feeding before we can actually allow you to start the program. Um, so those, um, those started in January and they start in January every year and they go through March. And we did have, uh, we did have to cancel one because COVID did hit and we went to teleworking, but we picked that one back up a few weeks later in April in a webinar and we had multiple people on that and that was um, sent out through our car system and emails through the summer feeding system as well. Have I missed any, Carolyn? Uh, not that I have seen at the moment, but we may come back to you. Um, and I think we have um, maybe a special education question and uh, Todd, are you able to speak? <laughs> Yes, I'm here. So I think that this is relevant to special education, if I'm not mistaken, but there has been a question about Project 615 funds and are those able to be carried over? So the person's asked, 615 funds are the professional development allocation that we use every year to dis for districts. Um, it's not currently able to be carried over because it is already carryover money. And so we will potentially be adding money to 615 next year, uh, but um, it, it won't be able to be carried over the same way your regular IDA allocation is. Thank you. Okay, and we've got a couple of questions about RSA activities over the summer. 
I don't know if um, Tiffany, Neil, or Melissa Algram are on the call. They may not be, but I do know that there has been um, RSA guidance that's put out on our website um, specific to RSA, so you might check that. I can't recall off the top of my head if these questions are addressed there. I do also know that there's been a couple of um, RSA webinars um, that have occurred where, um, uh, where those may be able to be addressed. And I see maybe Tiffany is on the call. Um, and if Tiffany, if you're able, questions about um, RSA summer school and the summer reading programs, um, and is that, um, uh, do we have guidance on that? We are currently working on guidance related to the summer school opportunities uh, in, uh, of course, adherence to CDC guidance, ultimately. Uh, however, I will put a link to the RSA guidance and the FAQs in the chat box, as well as links to the two video recordings from the webinars. <clears throat> I'm scrolling, Superintendent. <laughs> yes, and I, I see the question about bus driver permits that will expire prior to bus driver class taken due to COVID-19. And just a question about if um, these only last six months and cost $60 a person. Um, I know that our bus drivers and providing that opportunity for them to become certified are, are critical. Um, is this something that we've got anyone on the call that could speak to that? Obviously, I believe this is a Department of Public Safety. Yes, and, and this is Carolyn. I don't know that we have a response for that, but we will um, try to reach out to DPS and inquire about that. So thank you for that, that question. We'll, we'll try to get some clarification. Uh, and maybe um, perhaps a question for Monty um, um, asking you to clarify something that maybe I said <laughs> um, regarding CARES Act funding. I know the CARES Act um, allows for those funds um, or directs that those funds should be used to help um, with continuity of staff and, and paying staff, but um, would that be new salaries um, if districts bring on new staff? Um, uh, or uh, the question is, can we pay for staff currently paid out of general fund um, and a concern for would that be supplanting? Since, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, okay, we're, we're gonna have to kind of rethink federal programs just a little bit, okay? A supplement not supplant does not necessarily apply to the Relief Act funds. So, based on the information that we have currently received, if you need to continue those services of someone that's currently under contract, that would be acceptable. All right. Is so we've had a, yes, I think that answers the question. Thank you, Monty. Um, and we've had a couple of questions about custodial staff um, returning to buildings um, uh, if the uh, stay at home directive is somewhat lifted on April 30th. Uh, Superintendent or Brad, would you want to address those questions? Yes, I, I feel, of course, that that is work that is important. And we know that custodial staff are working right now to keep uh, the area clean and sanitized for those who must be in the building. Uh, but with any kind of custodial work, just uh, I think it is very important that that which is essential uh, is still allowed, uh, but it is um, you know under the CDC guidance of social distancing. Brad, would you wanna answer further or um, no, I, I think you said it uh, very well. I mean, the, you mentioned the essential uh, personnel in the state board's order from March 25th, those kinds of services for uh, building maintenance and continuity of building functions would be included. Um, certainly adhering to CDC guidelines would be a part of that, but uh, I think you covered it. All right, and I did see a question uh, about the status of the state level agreements with telecommunication providers for hotspots and internet access. Um, I think that it's just important to let you know that work continues and um, the governor's office, Secretary Ostro, is working on this with our office. 
uh, as well as separate um, from that uh, would be the conversations that we will have with the governor's office related to the GEAR fund. So, um, Carolyn, do you have anything else to add, though, for that, um, giving an answer? Um, I don't necessarily. We are waiting on um, what the telecommunications companies would offer as far as hotspots. I did see one this morning, and, and I'll just be frank, I was a little disappointed. It was a little higher still than I would have um, hoped for. So we are still continuing to work those channels um, and contacts, and we'll pass that along um, as soon as we have that information. Um, also, I just want to note, I saw the question about um, required immunizations, and I don't know that we have um, thought through that or have an answer for that just yet, but I will um, definitely put that on the list to investigate. So thank you for that question. And then um, uh, one question about um, TLE um, from um, I think this you had put that in there once before, and I, I think I saw it and then missed it. Um, so what documentation can be provided to show progress and what kind of documentation is required for the portfolio? Um, is there anybody from our team that can um, uh, speak to that? And she's also mentioning um, for emergency certification. So yeah. I think the portfolio piece is for emergency certification and documentation for TLE. Hopefully. <laughs> I, I think that's right, Carolyn. Uh, one of the requirements on the uh, additional year for an emergency certificate into that third year uh, is inclusion of a portfolio of work. And another requirement is uh, related to TLE. So I, I think that's where the questions um, are coming from. On the portfolio of work, I think that's somewhat uh, intentionally broad, meaning it's up to the individual in the requesting district to, to build out that portfolio and demonstrate uh, the cause for why that uh, extension should be granted. I think some of the things that could be included in a portfolio would be uh, professional development, attended trainings, um, attempts to take the test, um, things along that nature, coursework. Um, those are just some examples, but I, I think we left it somewhat broad uh, on purpose so that, you know, there's flexibility there. All right, thank you. Um, I wonder, um, I think we're going to continue to get lots of questions about graduation ceremonies. Um, there was a question here about a local radio station promoting live streaming of graduation ceremonies and um, that it seems that there might be some doing them on school property um, as early as May 9th. Again, um, I'm not sure of the scenario there, and we know there are plans to do virtual graduation ceremonies. Of course, I would imagine um, that that would involve um, even virtually, there, there could be a staging or something um, that the administration is using, I don't know. Um, but the bottom line to all of this is, please do not jeopardize the, um, health of those that we are trying to protect, and you are as well, um, to quickly get to a graduation ceremony that feels like what we have had in the past. Um, it can be virtual, and um, I think there was even a question about if we, if we have eight graduates, is it possible to do it where parents are in their cars? You know, I think that's part of the creative answer. And um, I'm hearing many examples of creative answers to honoring the work uh, that has led to this point for many seniors. So I encourage you to do that creative work while still um, following the governor's executive orders, which include following the CDC guidance. And um, let me see, it looks like, um, you know, the governor in his press conference right now is addressing the opening of Oklahoma and uh, standing with him, I understand, um, is the state chamber. So we know that there is a plan that's being laid out and uh, we will get that information ourselves and see if there needs to be any updates. But, um, you know, we had one day this week, 20 additional deaths. And this, we are still in the midst of a pandemic in Oklahoma. 
So please be aware of that. Okay, Superintendent, I think by and large, we've answered just about every question that we can, or um, I'm, I've made a couple of notes about new things for us to check on, um, maybe give a couple of, um, another minute or so for folks if they wanna type one last question in that we can try to answer, but um, perhaps maybe wrap up here shortly. Okay, we sure will. And I um, saw that there was someone who asked a question about TLE and uh, hasn't yet received an answer from uh, the State Department. And we, we will be sure to get right on that. Um, I'll ask Dr. Robin Miller to help you, um, Maria. And um, if you could put your email in the chat, uh, that'd be great. Wow. All right. Anything else, Carolyn, before we wrap up? Um, I, I don't think so. Uh, let me see here, getting a, one or two stragglers here. Okay, okay. so um, we've already said everything I've just repeat, mentioned in our FAQs. Um, if it sounds different the way I'm saying it, um, please refer back to the FAQs. We will update those as the governor's order will change some of this likely with um, time after uh, May 1st. So I still would say, please be very careful that we do not make plans that jeopardize the health of our families who would be attending um, if any kind of physical gathering even with social distancing so uh please be very careful and uh again at this time that is not physical gatherings for graduation um are not likely to be possible unless you have s such a very very small class um, where parents are staying in their cars or something so um that is um probably far too specific answer um, and a unique example than what is helpful for the rest of uh, those on this call. So again, I would just refer you to the CDC guidance and our FAQs for now and be very cautious in how we plan for the future. All right. Okay, well, I thank you again um, and just want to tell you how incredibly proud I am to be able to brag on you uh, in the media as well as in groups that are discussing what we are doing in Oklahoma uh, in national venues um, and conversations. I am so incredibly proud of the work you're doing. Um, I know that our focus is um, turning to the, the education and the um, loss of learning. And so as we gear up for that and have to uh, deal with the downturn in the economy. We know that your jobs um, have just grown even more complex and um, you are shouldering a lot. So we want to be here to help and support and I appreciate you. So stay safe and have a good rest of the week. Thank you all. Take care.